I don't know. I said some stuff there that I never said before, like analogies. And it's like, man, I'm going, man, I wish I recorded it because I hardly remember what I said. <laughs> Maybe I can reproduce it because I talked a little bit about pain last week, I think. And um, then one of our, our people, um, Lauren, just recently just sent me this thing about wanting to learn how to you know, do the pain finding process. So I'm gonna um, I'm gonna cover there are nuances to it, okay? You know, at the on the boot camps we try to teach a basic kind of basics of pain finding, but there are other nuances to it, you know, and um, just why I really recommend this book. Uh, you can't teach a kid to ride a bike at a seminar, and you know, folks that are in the Sandler system, I mean, they practice this all the time, you know, and it just comes out. Um, yeah, it's a skill like any other skill, right? So it's something you got to practice. You got to practice, you got to practice and kind of get the the feel for when you're going in the right direction. And we'll, we'll give you guide guidance. Uh, and, and the boot camp will give you a little bit of guidance, but it's, you know, again, just basics. Um, you know, you can't expect to be a professional from day one. You know, like professional athletes, they started when they were like five years old, you know. So it took them time, you know, hopefully you're not going to take that long. Um, here it's, uh, you know, really uh, a process of learning, you know, and I think that when it comes to becoming good at this, you got to fall in love with the process of learning. And the process of learning, like anything else, is painful. <laughs> We're talking about pain. Well, that you, you're going to go through failure and go through discouragement because that's just part of the process. I mean, tell me anything worthwhile that you didn't go through discouragement and, and unmet expectations. I mean, geez, how many of y'all been married any length of time? <laughs> I mean, you come into this marriage thinking that you really know the person and you just find out that you only know them. They only reveal to you only so much. There's so many layers as you go through your life together. And part of it is experiencing things and, and finding out how they react to things that they, you've never experienced with them before. And they start revealing kind of the inner core. And, and you think you're close enough after you get married, but all you all have been married a while. You know what I'm saying? You gotta, you're peeling the layers, like you're discovering things about your spouse. Like there's things I discovered about Jenny after her going through cancer that I'm like, oh my gosh, man. She's like freaking incredible. You know, when, when someone's faced with adversity like that and you just kind of, you kind of get to their inner core. And I don't know that till the day I die, I'll ever get to really truly know her, you know, as well as I want to, you know. And um, I think same thing with the uh, pain finding process or pain finding process with getting really good at this. You need to understand that it's a marathon, not a sprint. Yeah, I know you need to make money. And we'll get you to some basic level of, you know, um, that skill. But it's a lifelong learning process. I mean, I'm, I'm big into lifelong learning. You never stop learning. And if you, if you stop learning, then you're going backwards. You're degrading. You know, and that's why I think you see people that, you know, they go up and down in their performance because they never continue to grow. They never continue to improve. You know, and so a lot of that is looking at the mirror and, and really stripping away all these things that you see about yourself and get to the core where sometimes you got to, you know, slice yourself open and look at what's inside, you know, what's motivating you. So, um, so in, when you come to a conference call like this, a webinar like this, um, I'm assuming everyone's coming to become better at what you're doing. And so in order to really get the most fruit out of any encounter, it's stripping away all the junk, stripping away the filters that, you know, should I or shouldn't I? Uh, I like what he's saying, but, you know, I don't know about this, okay? <laughs> right? So, you know, come with a mindset of, man, I seek to learn. I want to understand. I want to open myself up because I'm not as good as I could be. 
you know, and I'm not as good as I could be, but every time I try to teach this, I become better. Okay. That's why I've enjoyed the process of doing boot camps every week since June is that I feel like I've become better. You know, I've improved. Like if you watch one of my um, webinars for the boot camp from when we started to now, it's, I've gotten tighter, more efficient, I think less complicated. And I'm still trying to get better at making it less complicated. Like, um, I guess Ruby's on the call. So Ruby's going through boot camp. And so I'm trying to figure out how to make the um, sales, in home sales process less complicated so people can just come to it and, you know, have less fear. Um, but, you know, let's reopen. And, and it doesn't end here, okay? It doesn't end here. It's getting around the system and learning, listening to Andy Albright on all the conference calls and webinars and whoever substitutes for him and being like we call plugged in. You know, plugged in is really um, hitching your wagon to the Ions train and really selling out, you know, because when you look at all the successful people, they all didn't do it overnight. <laughs> they were supported and uplifted by the system going to hotspot meetings, going to national conferences and the family reunion conference in the summer, um, getting around the people at the hotspots, just being very uh, diligent, diligent, committed to the process. And that is our process. That is the Alliance process is exposing you to new ideas, new ways of thinking. Okay, that's what I love about Doug Becker. Gives you a different perspective from the surfer dude, right? The surfer dude perspective. and when you kind of look at something from a different angle, it makes you discover something about yourself that, you know what, wow, you know, I, I thought maybe I could be like that, but I felt like everything I've listened to, I'm not like all those other things. But when I heard Doug Becker, I could do that part. I could be me. <laughs> I think Doug has given you the permission to be relaxed and to be you. But if you peel the onion behind what Doug's words are, he is an assertive guy, right? And he, he veils his assert, assertiveness with that laid back surfer dude mentality, right? And this is what the pain finding process is, is you're creating the openness of someone with someone so that they're willing to open themselves up a little bit. Because when you're finding pain, okay, 35 years married, oh, that does rock. I'm, uh, what, I got married in 91, so I'm 29. <laughs> I'm right behind you, <laughs> 29. Yes, organization, organized work ethic, absolutely. So um, Doug Becker, he disarms them. He charms them to open up that they could just be normal with him. See, that's the beauty of it. I think what happens is your client reflects you, how you are with them. They're a mirror to how, you know, so if you want to know how you're coming off, you just read your client and that's how you're coming off, man. If they're defensive and feel, you know, nothing, that's because you're making them feel like that. Okay. I, I think anyway, I mean, I think if you go in thinking, oh, they're just mean or they're just this and that, well, you can certainly rely on that. The problem is that you're never going to get further ahead. So in other words, if you're trying to make them, get them to be vulnerable with you on their pain, you've got to be vulnerable too. You can't put up the, the defense mechanisms. You know, it's kind of like in battle, you got your shield up, the enemy has this, their shield up, okay? It's adversarial, right? right? I think I did talk about that last week. The adversarial thing, you know, people come in thinking that you're a, you know, that you're trying to sell them something and they're thinking I need something and I don't want someone to sell me something. I want to buy what I need. And it's kind of like coming off like, you know, like this. And the, the whole modern rapport thing is to get them on your side of the table and go into their side of the table through the power of empathy. And the power of empathy is what's going to get you effective pain finding questions because you're, empathizing with them you're open to them and you yourself are being vulnerable to them i mean king man let me ask you i mean i always look i love when doug talked about it's a blind date <laughs> it's a blind date 
it's a blind date. Now, I've never gone on a blind date myself. I've never gone on a blind date. So I actually don't know what, I don't know what that's like, okay, at all. But I've started relationships, and I know my game, okay, so I have my game. I have this way when I get to know someone I'm interested in. I, I, I kind of... <laughs> I'm really good at bond rapport, in other words. And so, I mean, it's just all about that, you know, and when you want a f someone to feel that they can trust you by answering your questions, they, they gotta feel like you're that kind of person, that it's a safe environment to talk because they trust you and they feel good about you. Now, look, that's something to develop, you know, and something that you gotta practice, um, and you're not gonna get good at it instantaneously. You know, but if you use some of these techniques we're going to teach you, man, then you're, you're going to get to that pain finding process. Alex, I thought this was finding pain, not bond and rapport. <laughs> hey, man, you can't find pain without building strong enough bond and rapport. That's what we're talking about pain is making sure that you've done enough of this stuff, how to make people like you in 90 seconds or less. I would just like to learn how to do that. This is the other book. Okay. I'm hawking books. I don't make a dime off these, man. I make a dime when you make money. So, you know, I think these books are awesome. And um, that gets them opening, opening up to you. <laughs> anyway, so no one's, gonna, no one's going to care about what you say until they know how much you care. Absolutely. That's, uh, um, what is it? Uh, Zig Ziglar, right? That's a Zig. That's a Zig uh, quote. That was from uh, Curtis. That no truer words have been said. You know, it's kind of like, again, I go back to the dating analogy. You know, when you think about how you came to discover that your spouse is the one that you want to be with for the rest of your life. You know, coming to that conclusion. So, okay. So let me kind of draw a contrast. Pain finding is not features and benefits selling, okay? So kind of the classic sales guy is going to go into, hey, this has return of premium rider. This has member benefits. This has living benefits. This company's been around for 135 years. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and you don't even know why the person's sitting in front of you. You don't know what they're looking for. You don't know about them. You're... You know, you're thinking that all the shiny stuff and you're polishing it up and, and so on is going to be the thing that attracts them. Or you do the shotgun method that something that comes out of your mouth will somehow trigger the response, oh, yeah, that's what I'm looking for. You know, I mean, it's like, why? <laughs> Futures benefit selling ain't my thing, man. I'm not, I don't want to waste my breath. You know, how much, I don't know how many of y'all been selling features and benefits, man, but um not a good way to do things. You sound like every other salesperson. You know, people don't want to don't want to be people don't want to be sold. They want to buy what's going to fit their needs. Okay. Um, so, um, Alex, are you recording? <laughs> Thank you for asking. Yes, I am. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. D. Uh, man, I'm so glad I have some people that got my back on that. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about these, these ideas and pain finding um, and maybe repeat some of the stuff from last week. But um, I don't think it's a bad thing to repeat some of the stuff from last week. Um, but we're going we're gonna to drill even further from what we did last week. Remember, we talked about um, the pain and pleasure idea. Pain and pleasure. Okay. People are motivated to get away from pain, or people are motivated towards gaining pleasure. Okay. So we are not selling um, timeshares. Okay. Okay, timeshares is all about features and benefits. You know, the pleasure of going somewhere that it's already paid for and you don't got to worry about it because you have a 
you know, a, a partial ownership in something. I've never bought one. Okay, so I don't know. I don't know the sales pitch, but you know, what's the pain? Well, I guess the pain they can develop is that, you know, when you go on vacation, how much do you spend on your hotel stay or the resort? You know, again, I've never sold timeshares, but I imagine, I'm just imagining, you know, kind of what that, what that whole deal is. Let's see. Yeah, that's right. Questions are it. Oh, thank God. I work for a timeshare company. <laughs> I didn't know that, Ruby. Well, anyway, I'm just kind of repeating what I hear about that stuff. But, but man, we're in the business of pain, the pain of what's your family going to do now? I mean, you know, we call this a love product. People don't buy life insurance for people they don't love. So what a strong emotion love is. You know, what's love got to do with it? Yeah, love got every, everything to do with life insurance. <laughs> That's this, I tell you what, you tap into this emotion, people do stuff out of love, you tap into this emotion, it rocks. It totally rocks. So one of the most important, okay, so I'm mixing metaphors here, not metaphors, I mix, I'm mix, mixing motivation and influence psychology things here with, with this. So psychologically, um, like if I said something like, uh, uh, name the luckiest dwarf that you know of, or the sleepiest dwarf, think about the sleepiest dwarf, Dwarf, D-W-A-R-F, right? Okay, so I want you to think of a number between one and one and ten. Okay. So write that number down, and then let me tell you what that number is. You probably that number is probably the number seven, right? <laughs> okay, now maybe some of you didn't. I was big into Game of Thrones, so when I think of the luckiest dwarf. I think about that little dude that played, um, you know, whatever. I forgot what his name is. I think that's a lucky dwarf because, man, that dude's making some ton of money, right? Anyway, you probably thought of seven. Well, why would you think of the number seven? Is I talked about dwarfs. And in your mind, you were thinking dwarfs. Well, you think of the seven dwarfs. I didn't say seven. But you're, maybe you were thinking of sleepy and grumpy, you know, happy. <laughs> so what did I do? I totally set your mind up. I set your mind up to think about the number seven. I didn't tell you to pick seven, but I'd say probably more than half of you probably thought of the number seven. And I did that really quick. Like if I were going to be really good mentalist type of person, I would just really develop this. And then now this is what I want you to think about. And then I go back to, okay, now give me a number between one and 10, you know, seven, right? Well, what I did is I tapped into something that was in your subconscious already, and then I had you think about it because I wanted you to think about it. See how that works? It's really, um, I guess, Ruby, it is kind of manipulation in a way. It's manipulating how people's predispositions are, okay? It's getting them in the right mindset to be open to finding pain, okay? So one of the best setups, and whether you knew we did this or not, is embedding within the questioning process. So tell me, so this, these are all the set of questions for paint funny. So tell me, how did you two meet? Okay, you're totally embedding this. We embedded this into the sales process as a question so we can get them thinking, right, about taking care of their families. They weren't thinking about it before, but now, so tell me, how did you two meet? And getting into the state of remembering why they love each other and how they met each other, why they fell in love with each other and how much they love each other. It's all about love, man. Love, love, love. <laughs> Talking about love. Yeah, man, it's all about love. So this is a mega motivator 
for this part, okay? They love their family so much, they, they don't want them to be in pain, right? Their empathy for their family is what puts them in pain. Your empathy for helping them discover that is where the pain finding process is. That's where that rests, that's where it resides. Now, if you just do a cold open, all right, I'm here. Okay, you're looking for more protection. Sounds good. We got some great policy. In fact, this one company, let me tell you about this one company. Man, this one company has living benefits. Like if you get chronically ill, critically ill, terminally ill, they've got benefits for that death benefit that will rock the house. By the way, they've got member benefits too. So they're going to invite you to a Cincinnati Reds game and you can have free hot dogs and popcorn or whatever. And they're going to invite you that for free. Is that cool? And they got an orphan benefit too. And they do college, um, they'll, they'll do college awards scholarships. Is that cool? And they got free financial planning. You can get a free wealth from them also. You know, and then they're one of the best companies that have been around for 135 years. You know, so let me show you some quotes and let's, let's get this done. <laughs> it's like, man, they don't even know if they want to do it. They were fighting with each other, <laughs> you know, the, the, before you came in. So this is a great one. Tell me how did you two meet? The other one that we embed, and this is like from my boot camp, is um, do you know anyone? That has died, anyone close, that has died recently, okay. Oh, really? How did they die? Heart attack? Oh, man. Man, that's terrible. Now, did, did, uh, did your uncle have life insurance at all? Oh no, he didn't have life insurance, okay. Oh, what happened? I'm sorry, Ruby, you're gonna get this repeated tonight. What happened? What happened? Well, it was really hard for the family. Or, you know, and if they did, if they did have life insurance, oh man, well that's great. What, how did the family fare after that? I mean, he left them with a $200,000 policy. Oh, man. Okay, another set of questions. You got them thinking about what it is we're doing here, but you're setting them up for the pain funding process. Again, going back to, you know, um, think about a sleepy dwarf. <laughs> think about a grumpy dwarf. <laughs> anyway. You're totally setting, these are like mega setup questions. Do you know anyone who, um, you know, part of this is um, ever been, ever been, ever been involved in planning a funeral? So this would be more of the um, final expense. You know, if you're talking to a senior, they probably help with their parents' funeral. Like I guarantee you, how much did it cost? Right. So these are all set up questions to get into the pain finding questions, right? So you uncover pain by asking questions. These are all the set up questions to get you there. So, you know, this comes out of the Bonner Rapport. This is all Bonner Rapport. This comes all the kind of the Bonner Rapport section, which then allows you to move into the pain finding, okay? So here's what you want them to feel. This is what you're trying to get them to feel. You want to get them to feel love for their families, that their motivation is love for their families. You also want them to feel like, I don't want this happening to my family, or I do want this happening for my family, right? Okay. One of the other things I might say if they talk about someone who has died is, oh man, you know, people that die of heart attacks, I bet you they weren't thinking about dying of a heart attack that time of day. I mean, when they woke up that morning, I bet you they were thinking, you know, what they're having for dinner that night. They're thinking about playing golf in the weekend with their, with their friends. They're probably thinking about Thanksgiving coming up in a couple weeks. Their kids are coming over. It's, it's a, man, 
You know, because um, someone asked me, uh, was it Misty? Misty, or someone asked me, Alex, you know, when, when clients calculate the premium they're paying, seniors, they find that at, by the time they're age 90, from where their age is, they've more than paid for the death benefit. You just stick in the calculator. Well, when I'm 90, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna have paid in more than what the death benefit is. Man, this, is, this, isn't, this ain't right. <laughs> and so, oh man, you're, you know, you're absolutely right, sir. Okay, I agree with them. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. You know, look, that is absolutely valid. You know, absolutely valid. Um, if you know exactly when you're going to die. Like if I knew exactly that I was going to die um, at age 90 from now, then what I would do is I'd put this money away um, in an interest-bearing account from now till then, and um, then I'd be self-insured, right? And I'm smiling, right? I'm smiling. It's a valid argument, man, if you know exactly the day you're going to die. I'm smiling. But does that make sense? Or did, was I an a-hole by saying it like that? I mean, I'm doing it nice, right? Someone chat at me. I mean, so I, we get that a lot. We get that question a lot. You know, well, I'm going to, it's like, yeah, I mean, it's perfectly valid if you know, you're gonna, you know exactly when you're going to die. I just shut up. So, Joe, look, you know anyone that died in a heart attack? Again, asking questions. Yeah. Name the name of the person that died of a heart attack that you know. Well, I, I one of my buddies, you know, Jeff Smith. So let me ask you, when Jeff woke up, did he think he was going to die of a heart attack? Well, probably not. Probably not. <laughs> well, I'm just saying, I mean, he was, when he woke up, he probably thought that he was thinking about what he was having for dinner that night. Maybe thinking about Thanksgiving when his kids are coming back. Um, probably think about playing golf with the boys. Now, the most effective way to do that is when you know something about the person you're talking to. Because what you're saying about his friend, you're saying to him. Okay, if you know the guy likes playing golf, you know the guy has kids that are coming in for Thanksgiving, then you totally use that for the guy that died. So you see how you transfer? You're saying it about the guy, but you're transferring it to him. He's doing the mental work of going, that's me. It's a, it's a slick little thing. It's a, like the trans, transitive property of A equals B. If A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C, right? So that's what you're doing. You're playing that game. Makes complete sense. I don't think they are be offended. Yeah. So you kind of set them up like that. Say, man, so he's probably thinking about his kids coming in for Thanksgiving. A great Thanksgiving was going to be this year. He was probably thinking, playing golf with the buddies. And it's everything this guy does, man. He was probably thinking about um, speaking at church, going to his Bible study. Uh, he's probably thinking about all that. And then if you know they're Christian, you go, but it's like, an in it's like a thief coming in the middle of the night, unexpected, right? So you can throw in scripture. I always do that when I know people are, believers because i'll you know because i believe that stuff too like i'm not doing anything out of insincerity it's all sincere anyway the point being that these questions are the basic set of questions so what you're wanting them to feel is how much they love their families and you think they would do anything for their families absolutely they would do anything for their families they would do anything for their families i mean think about what you would do for your family you would die for your family man you would die for your kids. If your kid, it was either your kid or you, you would take the hit without even thinking about it. Your wife or you, you would take the hit. That's what we're trying to get them to feel, right, when we set that up. So these are all the setup in the Bonner Report. And then when you get to the pain process, okay, the pain process is finding questions. It's the pain funnel, okay, because people buy an emotion. Oh, I'm sorry. People justify logic, but they buy an emotion. And to get the process going, because remember, the process of pain finding is their well, 
Okay, you take them from well to sick to critical to terminal back to miracle terminal back to miracle. Okay, miracle. So you, you got to get them through this process in a very kind and nurturing way. And it starts three questions. You got to ask three pain questions to get them down here. Emotional versus logical. The first two questions, they're going to answer with what we call an intellectual smoke screen. <laughs> it's called an ISS, intellectual smoke screen. So tell me why I'm here. When you filled this form out, what's the most important thing on your mind? Well, we were thinking about just how much this is going to cost. <laughs> That's what they all say. We are thinking about how much this is going to cost. I sound like you, you're. <laughs> all right, logical. Okay, well, tell me more about that. I know we're going to talk about how much it costs. You know, my job is to fit this in your budget. Um, so let's, you know, let's pretend we take care of that later. So tell me what was on your mind when you first filled this out? What were you thinking about? Well, we're, you know, we think we might need this, but it really depends on, you know, how much this costs because our budget is very limited. Yeah, they, they kind of cling to the intellectual smoke screen. Third question. Well, let me ask you, um, what do you want this policy to do for you and your family? You know, the, so the third question, well, we, we just want to make sure the family's going to, my family's going to be okay. Like when my husband dies, when, if Joe dies, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard to make that payment. Okay, so now you came up with the first emotional word, right? So the emotional words are, it's going to be hard difficult, okay, we're worried, frustrated, okay, don't know what we're going to do, uncertainty. See, when they don't use those emotional words, but when they start using it here, now you're like peeling the onion back, hard. And so hard means so many different things to different people. I want to know what she means by hard. So describe for me what does hard mean to you? What is, what is hard? Well, boom. They're going to tell you what's hard. Okay? They're going to tell you what's hard. So this is how you keep the pain, how you kick the can down the road on the pain finding. Okay? And this is where you really honestly can get into very canned, canned questions. These are relevant questions when you start exploring it with them. Okay, so, so some of the words, um, so what does, okay, insert wishy-washy word. Okay, a wishy-washy word is a word that isn't totally defined. It sounds bad or it sounds like you want it, you, you want to hear it, but it's, it's not defined. So you get them mean, okay? So what does hard mean? What does difficult mean for you? Okay, now you're starting to act like a, a therapist, psychologist to drill down. Like, but, but I'm not asking to be a psychologist. Your job is not to tear down to their deeper core person to embarrass them. The problem with pain finding is if you take it all the way, which nobody on this call probably will ever do that, take it all the way, because... Only people that are really good at this can take it all the way to where you, you cause the client to feel embarrassed. You cause a client to disclose something that, they're, that they never really wanted to tell you. You know, it, it, it ends up creating a negative situation. Now, I don't, honestly, man, you, ain't, you, you can't worry about that. You shouldn't worry about it. You'll never be that good, okay, um, unless you've done, done this for years and years and years. Okay, I can go there and it's bad. You don't want to do that. And trust me, you're not going to get there. So what I'm saying is you don't want to drive it too, too hard. So the problem with telling you that is that you're not going to do it enough. That's why I probably shouldn't have said that. Okay. 
what does wishy-washy mean? Okay, and they, they do another word. Okay, they do another wishy-washy word. Oh, okay, good. So, yeah, hard to pay. It's going to be hard to pay the mortgage. Ah. So what is the mortgage payment? What is your household income? How much money are you going to lose when Joe dies? What's the, wow, how are you going to, you know, how are you going to afford anything else, right? They naturally, all of a sudden it kind of naturally follows this line with them. So here's some other um, pain questions. Um, what were you hoping, hoping this policy could do for you? Okay, what were you hoping this policy can do for you? All right. Um, how do you feel about that? Joe, you heard Mary talk about what's going to happen to Sammy, Sammy, Martha, and Bridget. How, how do you feel about that? Uh, you know, when you ask him how he feels, you know, he's going to come up with feeling words. Well, that would, uh, that wouldn't feel too good. <laughs> you know, um, um, when did you first decide that you should do something. With this. That's a good one because they'll talk about, well, you know, we were about thinking about it for, you know, after we got the mortgage and then we got the letter or thought, you know, we really need to look into this. Okay. So what do you mean by look into it? Well, to see if it's, you know, we can afford it and stuff. Okay, great. Well, tell me, what were you hoping something like this would do for you? Well, we were hoping for, you, do you see how you can just kind of maneuver? It's all kind of maneuvering them with questions. So the paint questions are like a guideline, guardrails, that you kind of guide the person down the pain process. You're putting like, you know, they, it's a bump car. They bounce here to here, and then they get to you get to the core you know, the core of what they're doing. It doesn't got to be, like, I, I don't want you to think that you got to make them cry, okay? You don't got to make them cry, although I've helped people cry about feeling the problem that they have, okay? Now, I'm not going to tell you that's ultimately where you want to go there with them because sometimes that can be too far. I'm not asking you for them to relive the, the loss of a loved one where they're just like, you know, but I am asking you to, to drill it down, man, to where, you get them feeling like they, they got to do something. See, by the time you get them terminal, all of a sudden that budget they had in, the mo in their mind becomes, it like goes from, okay, we can only afford $50 a month. But then when you go do the pain process properly, it starts raising to, I will do anything. I'll do anything to protect my family. Okay? I'll do anything to protect my family. Okay? And that that comes out of asking these questions and guiding them. Okay, so here's, um, okay, so let me, uh, okay, I talked about the problem where you can be too effective at this. Um, <clears throat> okay, so you know, taking it to the extreme, where you where you blow it, if you take it to the extreme, is you're going to make them feel embarrassed. Number one, you're going to not make them feel okay about themselves. Okay, so I don't know if you guys ever worked with a transaction transactional analysis TA it was pretty popular in the 70s and 80s. Um, it's the I'm okay, you're okay thing. You know, that when you meet each other, you're in a, in a state. In fact, let me talk about that because I think that's a, it's, it's a good thing to talk about. 
Because remember, we're talking about putting the paint in the proper state so that you can ask the paint questions and the paint questions are effective, all right? So there's a, there's a state, um, there's the um, okay, not okay, right? Okay, not okay. So they're feeling okay about themselves. People are feeling okay about themselves or they're feeling not okay about themselves, okay? What causes someone to feel not okay is when you talk about how okay you are, okay? It's sort of this kind of measuring thing. It's kind of a scale, okay? Kind of, let's draw a scale. It kind of looks like this. Okay, here's a scale. Okay, um, client and you. So when you fill up, fill this up, this is the okay. You know, I made yours smaller. This is the okay bucket. This is their okay bucket, okay? And you start filling up all kinds of things, tell man, man, I have a great day. Joe, this is just an incredible week for me. How are you doing? <laughs> you started filling up, so all of a sudden it tips down where the client is not okay, and because you're okay, you're extremely okay, you're just having a great day. You ever had people do that to you where they just make you feel terrible because they're, everything's going so great in their life. It's like, oh my God, our life suck compared to his, you know? So by, by virtue of that being the, the, the dynamic, okay, is that you take, you take the weight of your okayness out, and so it tips like this, where they're feeling okay, and you pretend that you're not okay. So like, how are you doing, Alex? How are you doing? Oh, man, it's been, been kind of a rough day, honestly. Um, just unexpected stuff. You know, you ever have one of those days? It's like, um, yeah, you know, I've had better days. Okay, then they're thinking, wow, I am, uh, he's a nice guy, but I'm feeling pretty good at where I'm at right now. Like, I tell you what, I mean, this hits close to home. So when someone, you discover someone has cancer, guess what you're feeling? Okay, seriously, you will feel this way. It's like, thank God it's not me. I mean, you feel for the person. It could be your sister, brother, mother. You feel for the person, but that thing inside you says, man, I'm glad that's not me. Okay, like, you don't got to admit to it, but inside there's something in there that says, you know what I'm saying? You hear someone's problems, their kid. Like, I just found out yesterday that... Uh, one of the sales reps that I was involved with, um, had a relationship with years ago, um, just found out that his daughter committed suicide. His 18-year-old daughter committed suicide in March. And I just kind of caught him real quick because I heard about it, called him. And um, she would have been 19 this month. And in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, Lord, thank God that's not one of my kids. But what can I do to make sure that doesn't happen to my kids? Do you see what, when you hear a tragedy with someone else, you're feeling, I mean, I don't want to say you're feeling okay. You, you hurt for them. But it's like, man, I wonder what that would be like. I don't want it to be my kids. Thank God that's not my child, right? So this whole okay thing. So when you're asking pain questions, you don't want to drive the client to where they're not okay. I mean, certainly you're trying to get them here, but you don't want to go overboard you know, where they're totally not okay about their pain, okay? And then, um, then the other thing is you don't want them to have to admit they made a bad decision. So, like, they pulled one of their policies out, and it's a terrible policy, terrible. It goes up every five years in cost, or it goes up every year in cost. It's a renewable term. They might be paying 100 bucks for it now, but in 10 five years, they're paying $200, right? And you know it's a bad policy, 
but, but you don't want some, oh man, you just sucked. You made a bad decision. You know, <laughs> it's like, well, you know, you probably made the right decision at the time with the information you had. I certainly appreciate you caring about your family. Most people would just kind of not do it. So I think you, you, you were smart in putting a plan in place, right? So you don't make them feel bad, but let me show you something I think you might like better. I think you might like this one better based on what you told me about, you know, your fears about leaving your family unprotected without anything. Boom, you know, you're in the door. So you gotta have that nurturing, um, the nurturing um, mentality with it. Okay, so here's the, one of the keys too. Um, when you're asking these pain questions, you gotta be, okay, these are some of the skills involved. You gotta be an active, list, active listener. Real key, list, listener. Golly, what's up, man? What's up with me? <laughs> active listener. So how, how are you, how do you become an active listener? Number one, you, you gotta be in the, kind of in a spirit of empathy. Okay, and so one of the most, most important things about the empathic skill is I understand. When you say, oh, I understand. I know how you feel. I understand. One of the most, most important words, I understand how you're feeling. You know, that's not unusual. Sometimes people need a little bit, use you, well, they need a little bit of um, validation, okay? And then there's the par parroting. You rephrase what they said to you. Yeah, so what you're telling me is that because you lose about 75% of Joe's income, of your household income, that making a $1,500 mortgage payment will be just really hard to be able to do. That would just be very difficult for your family. You know, you just parrot it back at them. There's the other one of um, paraphrase, paraphrase. See, when people do this back at you, it makes you feel good about them because they're really listening, okay? Okay, and then the other one is repeat, repeat, back, it's a little bit of paraphrase, Re repeat back the emotional word. So it sounds to me like you're really afraid of what's gonna happen when you die, you don't have this in place, okay? I mean, use that afraid word, you lose, use that worried word. Okay, re so you're coming back at them. And when you're an active listener, that you're listening to what they're saying and then you respond. You're not listening so that you know when to respond. You're listening so you can respond with an appropriate and empath empathetic question or feedback, okay? You gotta be an active listener, which, which really kind of also assumes that you're an active questioner. Okay, an active questioner. Does it make sense so far? Or am I boring you? <laughs> okay, so here's, here's like an example from the outside world, <laughs> okay? We talk about the intellectual, the ISS, intellectual smokescreen. So here's someone who's responding logically. So it's like, let's pretend you're an accountant, right? And someone calls you, and they say, I would like to pay less in taxes and keep more money in my pocket. Okay. And what you'll probably tell them is, well, I can absolutely help you do that. Right? Well, what are your rates? You know, well, my rate is this. Oh, that's too expensive. Well, how extensive is your situation? See, it's all logical, logical, logical. Okay. The account has to get the person to say this, okay? So instead of, I would like to pay less taxes and keep more money in my pocket, they say, I'm tired of giving away my money to the government and I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm tired. We start using that sick and tired. When they start going to sick and tired mode, oh my gosh. It's like when you're recruiting. So 
why were you interested in kind of looking outside of what you do, man? It looks like project engineers make a lot of money, you know, that I know guys are very successful and they make a lot of money and, you know, perfectly happy with what they're doing. Are you kidding me? I am so, no, so the logic will be, well, I'm just looking to make some additional money, supplement what I'm doing. Oh, okay. Well, you know, maybe we could do that. I don't know. I mean, if you could find anything like that, that you could do for the next year or two, I mean, is that going to be a problem? Well, I, I'm really looking to do something right now. Okay, well, but I, I don't understand. I'm confused that, you know, most people in your career like love that career. Oh, well, let me tell you, I, I'm, I'm kind of sick and tired of our management and they're doing this to us and they're, and they start tearing up their job apart. They start tearing their job apart. And so when you're recruiting, you're finding pain. That's finding pain, right? Um, and then your whole attitude in the pain finding is you're caring and you're nurturing and you're just really understanding and you're in it with them. And you're, they feel that you're in it with them. You feel their pain, okay? Um, another one, uh, can you be more specific? Can you give me an example? Uh, what have you tried to do before me in trying to solve this problem? Like, have you sat down with any other agents and tried to take care of this? I mean, I'd like to know that. Well, there was a guy that came in last week and, you know, we just didn't really, really feel comfortable with him. Huh, that's interesting. Why didn't you feel comfortable with him? Well, he just really wanted to just, he, all he wanted to do is really fill out an application that night. We weren't ready to do it because we wanted to make sure we're making the right decision. Oh, man. Yeah, I hear you. So you, you want to feel good about making the, a decision. Yeah, we do. I mean, he was just trying to push, push, push. All he wanted to do is, it's like, oh, man, I can't believe guys are like that. Yeah, I'm not like that, man. I mean, look, if you want to take care of something today, that's up to you. If you don't, that's up to you. I don't, whatever. I'm just here to get this information to you so you're making a good decision for your family, right? That's all I'm here to do, okay? Is that okay to do that with you, to give you the proper information, find out what you're looking for, and give you some options that, you know, you'll be able to take care of all these issues with your family? Is that all right? Yeah, that's all right. Good, good. See, I mean, what you did was you found out more about that. That's, I love that question. Um, like, how do you feel about that? We were talking that. Okay. So here's, here's the thing about um, the pain finding process. You, your client is the one that runs the meeting. Okay. They believe they're running the show, but you're the orchestrator. <laughs> you are guiding them in them running the show. They feel in total control. But what they don't know is that you're controlling the conversation by asking questions. And the type of questions you ask and the way in which you ask them makes all the difference in the world. Now, if other focused on mortgage protection, so the whole thing about final expense, because typically we're just looking for final expense, mortgage protection, or general insurance, right? So the general insurance is about as easy as the mortgage protection. You know, it's usually a new marriage leave. You know, so wow, so you guys got married when? It says here, June. Yeah, man, how's the wedding? How did you two meet? Total setup, setup, setup. Oh, wow, what a great story. <laughs> what a great story. So when you were filling this form out, what were you thinking? What was on your mind and heart? Oh, price? Okay, yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, that's page 10. We're on page two. <laughs> what, what did you really want this to do for your spouse? for each other. Well, boom. Then you start the train. The pain train starts going. You get them from here to here, right? Okay. Final expense. So tell me, you know, what were you thinking about when you were filling this out? What was on your mind? What was on your heart? Well, we were just wondering, we might need something, a little something. Okay, little is a wishy-washy word. Little. So little, it's define little. What does little mean? Well, we already have a policy. See, that's what I want to know. I'm not going to say, do you have a policy? 
I want to say, well, you need a little something. Oh, we just need a little something. Okay, what's little mean? Well, I mean, we already have a policy in place. Oh, okay. Like, what did, tell me about that policy. Well, we have a $5,000 policy we've had for a really long time. And, um, you know, I don't think it's going to be enough. Well, I mean, $5,000 can more than get you a, a, a service, a funeral service and, and a cremation, right? I mean, 5,000 is probably more than enough to do handle that. So you, you mentioned the cremation word. So you got to watch their face when they talk about cremation, you know, cause they might be Catholic and not down with the church's new teaching on being, it's okay to be cremated. They may like go back to you, man, I ain't had my body turned to ash. <laughs> when when Christ comes back, man, I want to have my body intact. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's funny. They will like abhor the idea of cremation. Oh, no, 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 no. You know, when we got this, you know, 30 years ago, <laughs> we got this policy 30 years ago, 5,000 was more than enough, but man, oh, so you're, have you buried someone or have you been involved in planning? For your, yeah, my mom died. It was like $25,000. Really? $25,000? Okay, we're parrot, parrot. $25,000. Then you go negative reverse. Well, I'm sure you probably have $25,000 saved up that you can put towards a you know, funeral and all that. Uh, no. Oh, okay, huh. Well, let me ask this question. So let's say I walk out of here. Let's say you want to think about it. You don't want to do anything. I walk out of here and Joe tomorrow dies of a heart attack. How are you going to raise the money? You've got 5,000, so all you really need is maybe 20,000. So what would you do? How would you handle that? I just shut up and let them answer the question, right? Now look, if they say, well, we got plenty, we got plenty. I mean, we're gonna sell this house and we're gonna, we're gonna sell this house and then you know, downsize, we'll have plenty of money to um, take care of everything. Oh, well, okay, <laughs> I'm confused. Then why am I here? Like, you're not saying it like that, but it's like, oh, I'm confused. Well, I don't understand why I'm here. See, you gotta go the other way, man. Remember I talked about the pendulum and getting behind the client instead of trying to pull them towards buying. You go away from them and get behind them and say, well, I don't understand that. Why am I here? I don't understand why I'm here. Well, I mean, we just, we still need, see, you're not selling, but you're selling because you're saying, well, I don't know why I'm here. I'm confused. Well, we really, you know, we really do need something else. We, you know, we do have a, we can't do that, but it, you know, we can't just get the money out of it. Oh, do you have family that can help you out? Like how many kids did you say you had again? Five kids? Well, that's what? Five grand a piece, 5,000. I'm sure they could probably come up with 5,000 on a credit card or something to help you out. <laughs> I'm doing it nicely. I'm not being a smart ass. I'm going, I'm sure that could probably help you out. You've got five kids. Oh, uh, we're not going to ask them. No, no. Okay. Well, I, I was just confused why I was here because it seems like you had everything like already taken care of. Oh no, we don't. We don't. It's just, okay. You know, we really, really need to do something here. Okay. All right. Well, that's why I'm here. I'm going to help you to make sure that your kids aren't going to have to dig in their pockets out of the kid's college fund or whatever to. <laughs> I'm empathetic. I'm nurturing. I'm nice when I say stuff like that, but you know, and they're in the meantime, they're getting here. They went from here to here and you just got them. Then now they want to know. Now, some people will say, well, yeah, you're right. You're right. We don't have anything. We, I mean, we really, we just thought, you know, this might be a nice to have, but, um, you know, I just, but if it were, you know, if it's really cheap, well, then maybe we'd get something. Oh, well, this isn't going to be cheap. You know, this is not going to be a $5 plan. You know, you're 70, right? And it's, you mentioned that you had, you know, um, had dealt with a heart attack, you know, 10 years ago. And 
So you got some stuff going on. So this is not going to be cheap. Not going to be five dollar policy. Not going to be ten dollar policy. I mean, define for me what cheap is. Like, what? I mean, what did you want to pay for something like this? Well, I mean, we just don't want to pay too much. Oh, well, tell me about too much. What do you, what do you mean by too much? Do you see how you can just keep defining their words so they can just fess up to you what, what they really want, right? But look, if they don't need anything, then, well, it sounds like you don't really need me. And they go, well, yeah, probably not. Probably not. Okay, great. Well, let me ask you a question. Do you know anybody that died of cancer, of died of cancer, heart, or heart attack, or stroke? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we got, well, listen, we've got some programs like that where um, these are more critical illness type programs. So it doesn't cover, it doesn't have anything to do with your death. It just has something to do with cancer, heart attack, or stroke, any kind of critical illness. Um, so is that, I don't know, are you worried about any of those things? You've known people that had cancer? Oh, yeah. Like three of my, three of my best friends from high school died of cancer this last year. Oh, wow. Huh. You know, you can have that conversation and go, well, let me ask you, you guys, how much do you think you spend every year on, on health expenses? You know, what, what do you spend on medical? You just had to kind of add it all up. Co-pays, deductibles, um, prescription medications, you just ballpark it for me. Oh, man. Doctor's visits, co-pays, we're probably easily doing a couple hundred bucks a month. Like $2,500 a year? Yo, yeah, yeah, easily. Probably more, way more than that. Oh, wow. Well, let me ask you if, if I can cut that in half where you're not paying 2500 you're only paying, you know, 1250 you know, or something like that. Would, that. would that be something you'd be interested in looking at? How are you, how you going to do that? Well, let me explain this health matching account thing. Boom. So you got so many ways to go. By the way, are you, you know, do you have still, do you have money in the market still? Have you ever thought about like when you lose money, is that something that worries you or you, you're in a situation where it doesn't matter. You're just looking for the, the long-term gain. Like when the market went down last year, did were you kind of freaked out about that or are you calm as a cucumber? Oh, oh no, man. We're I've been thinking about getting that money out of there because I just can't stand another loss like that. Oh, so this is money you can't afford to lose. Really? Well, tell me more about that. How much did you lose last? Man, our account went down to twenty five thousand dollars. Oh man. You know, I hear that to get that return back, it's almost like a hundred percent you have to get more way more than that to get the money back to where it was, right? Like the rate of return's gotta be double, basically get it back up to that amount you had before, I've heard. Is that true? Oh yeah, the market has to do blah, 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 blah. Oh man. So in where the market is, do you expect that to happen anytime soon or do you expect maybe it could even go down further? Now you're tapping into some real serious pain, right? Well, oh gosh. Well, uh, just maybe simple, simple question. If it went down another 25,000, how would you feel about that? Okay. Oh, we can't afford to do that. Oh, wow. Well, um, here's what most people do in your situation. When they're in that situation, um, they like getting these particular called index annuity policies. Like, let me ask you a question. You have three things that can happen to your money. You can go up, you can stay the same or go down. So which one of these arrows are the ones that you don't want happen to your money? The down part? Okay, absolutely. Well, great. Well, it sounds like we really need to talk. Um, I have a friend of mine who's a financial advisor and he's at our central office. And what he does for most people in your situation is that he'll call you with me here and he'll find out more about your situation and he'll determine if there's something that we can do for you so that you don't have to worry about the loss of money, okay? And um, listen, let me, in fact, I can get on his calendar now. So why don't you pull your phone out, get on your calendar, let's see if we can book a time. Bam. Do you see how pain finding 
if you're savvy enough with all the things that we have at our disposal, that it will lead you to something really good. They only have pain about something that they have pain about, right? It's, it's, they hurt. It's not life. If it's not life insurance, it's probably something else, right? And we've got enough products to be able to, to help them. Does that make sense? Um, I'm going to, Unmute. Does anyone have any questions? Does this make sense or did I totally like blow you away? Like, freaking out right now. Okay. Sounds like Grand Central. All right, man. That's all I got, man. God bless, man. Happy selling. Go out there, practice these principles, be much more nurturing active listening, active questioning, drill them down, and have them define wishy-washy words. And man, you're gonna be you're gonna be snapping at this, man. I promise. Okay. Rock on. God bless. We'll talk to you guys later.